Okay, I'll just move it over here to the front. Good morning, uh, my brothers in Christ. My name is Jesse Romero. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh Lord, open up my lips so that my mouth may proclaim your praises. Lord, give me the tongue of an angel that I may speak the truth in love. I pray this in Jesus' mighty, holy, powerful, sweet, precious, majestic name through Mother Mary's intercession. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me give you the state of our country right now, the state of the world, so that we can uh, see what we're up against. I think it was back in, like, 1965, there was a radio personality by the name of Paul Harvey. Some of you could probably remember who he is. He gave a presentation called, If I Were the Devil. I want you to listen to what he said in 1965, because everything he said has already happened. Uh, right now, the United States, right now, is, is completely been impacted by Satan. Completely. Here's what he said in 65, quote, If I were the devil, I would gain control of the most powerful nation in the world. I would delude their minds into thinking that they had come from, come from man's efforts instead of God's blessings. If I were the devil, I would promote an attitude of loving things and using people instead of the other way around. If I were the devil, I would dupe entire states into relying on gambling for their state revenue. If I were the devil, I would convince people that character is not an issue when it comes to leadership. If I were the devil, I would make it legal to take the life of unborn babies. If I were the devil, I would make it socially acceptable to take one's own life and invent machines to make it convenient. If I were the devil, I would cheapen human life as much as possible so that the lives of animals are more valued than human beings. If I were the devil, I would take God out of the schools where even the mention of His name was grounds for a lawsuit. If I were the devil, I would come up with drugs that sedate the mind and target the young, and I would get sports heroes to advertise them. If I were the devil, I would get control of the media. <coughs> so that every night I could pollute the mind of every family member for my agenda. If I were the devil, I would attack the family, the backbone of any nation. If I were the devil, I would make divorce acceptable and easy, even fashionable. If the family crumbles, so does the nation. If I were the devil, I would compel people to express their most depraved fantasies on canvas and movie screens, and I would call it art. If I were the devil, I would convince the world that people are born homosexuals and that their lifestyles should be accepted and marveled at. If I were the devil, I would convince the, I would convince the people that right and wrong are determined by a few who call themselves authorities and refer to their agenda as politically correct. If I were the devil, I would persuade people that the, that the church is irrelevant and out of date and that the Bible's for the naive. If I were the devil, I would dull the minds of Christians and make them believe that prayer is not important and that faithfulness and obedience are optional. If I were the devil, I guess I would leave things pretty much the way they are. Paul oh, Harvey, good day. He wrote... That's the state of our country right now. Everything he said in 1965 is fully in place right now. I know there's a lot of dads and a lot of uh, grandfathers here. I'm going to tell you two things right now. And this is not a talk on the devil. That's going to be another talk. I want to talk about the Holy Eucharist. But I wanted to just let you know the state of the country and the state of the church right now. If you want to learn more about spiritual warfare from a Catholic perspective, I wrote a book. It's a best-selling book. It's called The Devil in the City of Angels. I was part of an exorcism team for many years in Los Angeles, and so I write about actual cases here. If you want to see what it is, the do's and don'ts, the power of a priest, how demons attack, I go through all the details in this book. And by the way, how does the devil attack our kids? A lot of you, some men were coming up to me this morning and saying, Jess, my kids, are, they, they've left the church a long time ago, and what do I do? I'm going to tell you that the two ways that the devil attacks the world. By the way, 
The devil is the father of lies. He's a murderer from the very beginning. There's no truth in him. But he has an army under him called demons. Okay? Demons have a rank structure. There's nine ranks of demons, and they're all under Satan. He's, he's the general, or they call him the father. How does the devil go after our kids as Catholics? Here's, he does this very subtly. He does this through atheism. And we were warned by Our Lady of Fatima that this is one of the errors that Russia would promote throughout the world, the cyanide, this poison of Marxist atheism. A lot of your kids say, Hey, Mom, Dad, I don't go to Mass anymore because I don't think there's a God. I wrote this book specifically for those young people, Atheism, the Opiate, the Opium of the Elites. And I take all of the questions that these Marxist professors, uh, they, they, they basically indoctrinate your kids with, and I answer them in that book. I answer them with science, I answer them with facts, philosophy, theology, and scripture. Another way these Marxist professors take your kids out of, out of schools, and just the culture in general, is they, they want us to believe that marijuana is medicine. Oh, give me some medicine. I wrote a book, What's Wrong with Marijuana?, and I wrote a lot, a lot from a spiritual warfare perspective. I can tell you this right now, from having been involved in healing, deliverance, and exorcism for many years. I'll tell you this right now. Demons, they're attracted to people that have addictive personalities. If you're addicted to alcohol, intoxication of any kind, pornography, any type of gambling, you're a magnet for demons. You will be tormented, annoyed, vexed. This is exactly what they look for. Demons are called 21 times in the New Testament, unclean spirits. And guess what demons are attracted to? Unclean people. What does that mean? Somebody who lives a life in mortal sin. If you live a life in mortal sin, you're, you're, you're basically jumping over the trap door of hell. Demons are attracted to people with addictive personalities to vice. So... And, uh, and one last thing that I won't get it, I won't have a chance to go through this morning. Some people wonder, just the Blessed Virgin Mary has authority over the devil. Absolutely, and he knows it. There's a promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I wrote this book, it's called Mama's Boy. Chapter 1, I wrote exactly why the devil fears Mary. All scripture. If you want, if you ever wondered why the devil fears Mary, like there's no tomorrow. I go through it deeply here in this book in chapter 1. Specifically, remember, the devil knows all the 36,000 verses in Scripture. He's bound by spiritual law, just like we're bound by spiritual law and natural law. Natural law. What comes up must go down. If I throw this book up in the air a thousand times, a thousand times it's going to come back down. That's called natural law. I can't do nothing about it. Demons are bound also by spiritual law. What God has written they must follow. Demons are lawyers from hell. They follow a very legal they follow a very legal line of demarcation that God has set up. And they know that the Bible says that there's a woman that will have power and authority to crush the head of the serpent. That woman is the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so Mary has total coercive power over the devil. And I've seen it. I, I'll just give you one story before I get into the Eucharist. This is worth it. I was helping out two holy priests in, a, in, in, in an exorcism over in, in uh, Los Angeles, California. This woman was a bad case. She'd been, uh, she was consecrated to Satan as a baby by her father. Her father was a Satanist. He was part of the cult of La Santa Muerte in Mexico. And he forced his daughter to practice Satanism and his wife forced them. Well, the father committed suicide when the girl was 18. But she was a mess because she'd been forced to practice Satanism for 18 years by dad. And dad raped her. Dad uh, did other things that I can't mention right now. It's in the book. To him and his wife. The father killed, the Satanist killed himself at the age of 18. Mom and, mom and the daughter, they flee Mexico and they move over to Los Angeles. She'd already been going through sessions. What's a session? A session is when a Catholic priest that has a mandate from the bishop to do an exorcism using a book called The Roman Ritual, The Rite of Exorcism, chapter 1, 2, and 3. They have a team of lay people there praying for them. And the priest with the authority of the bishop starts praying a specific prayer that was written in 1614, 18 by St. Charles Borromeo. Okay? And this is, the word exorcism means to drive out, to drive out, to drive out a demon from the body. Demons cannot attack the soul, they only attack the body. 
They attach themselves to the body of possession. Your soul is always under your dominion, under your control. That's the sanctuary between you and God. Demons cannot possess the soul, they can only possess the body. The only place where a demon can possess the soul is in hell. The damned soul in hell is now totally possessed soul and then body when they receive their body. But this girl, to make it, I'll just make it, and that story is in this book here, the first one, The Devil in the City of Angels. There's two priests, they're going back and forth. At the very end, they're praying one hour, two hours, three hours. Five of us are holding her down. Uh, four of her brothers, they're big young guys, and they're saying, uh, uh, Mr. Romero, when, when, this, when, when she manifests, she becomes as strong as a bull. They were right, absolutely. It took five, six of us to hold her down. They're praying over her for three hours, trying to expel the demon. Finally, what happens at the end, both priests are sweating. All of us are completely sweating like we've been working out. I mean, beads of sweat are coming down. Uh, and the one priest tells another one, what should we do next? I don't know, what should we do? Because they've done the ritual several times. It takes about 40 minutes to go through the entire ritual. Uh, one priest looks at me and says, Jesse, what do you think? I said, let's pray the rosary. So the priest says, okay, let's start praying the rosary. And the other priest says, hey, whoever knows it in Latin, pray it in Latin. So some people knew it in Latin, the priest did, I did. Some people knew it in Spanish, some in English. So we started. What was it new? Ave Maria, gracia plena, dominus tecum, benedicta tu mulieribus. Boom, as soon as we did that, within a minute, this woman was delivered completely. She let out an ungodly yell. It would have broke a champagne glass. An ungodly yell. She convulsed for about 60 seconds. The priest said the demons are leaving right now, just like in the New Testament. This is exactly the way you see it in the New Testament. She convulsed for about a minute. She screamed like she was an animal being killed in a slaughterhouse. And she, uh, her eyes came back. Her complexion came back. Her body was morphine. She came back completely to normal. And she let out a big sigh and started crying. And her mom was there. She said, Baba, Baba, they're gone, they're gone, thank you. The mom went over there, picked her up, sat her on the pew. The mom hugged her. She's, Mommy, Mommy, they left, they left, Mommy, thank you, Mommy. She told the priest, Father, thank you, thank you, they're, they're gone. The priest asked, Honey, he took out his notepad. He, he goes, Why did they leave? Because priests are always trying to perfect their craft. They're trying to perfect again the, the protocol that they use for exorcism and she said that last prayer that you prayed in that language she said they didn't like it they all had to leave what drove them out the Hail Mary in Latin and I went the priest did the rite of exorcism for three hours guess what nothing happened and it's a very powerful prayer very powerful nothing happened what drove the demon out the Hail Marys, over and over in Latin. Why? Because of Genesis 3.15, and demons know it. Mary has total coercive power and authority over demons, and they must obey because it's been written by God. Okay, I'm getting off on a tangent here. Let me go into the talk today, the Holy Eucharist. I love talking about spiritual warfare. As Catholics... We believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God the Son, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the Messiah, the Holy One of God, the Son of God, who has no beginning, has no end. Uh, all things are held in existence by Him. We believe He's more than a carpenter. We believe He's totally unique. And we believe because He's God, and because he said it in John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56, he says, Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my body and drinks my blood, I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. John chapter 6, verse 53 to 56. So what do we as Catholics believe? I'm going to go through the details, then I'm going to give you some powerful stories about the Lord Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. We believe that every Catholic priest is commissioned by Christ and has this authority that when he puts his hands over simple bread and wine, and that's all it is in the beginning, it's just bread and wine. He puts his consecrated hands that were consecrated by a bishop who's a successor of the apostles. And the priest, when he says the words of the Last Supper, and he calls down the Holy Spirit, we believe that the Holy Spirit, the, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, the Lord and Giver of Life, comes down upon 
that bread and wine and changes it entirely and substantially and really and truly into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Here's what St. Thomas says, taken from Aristotle. The, the substance completely changes. The substance from bread and wine is now the substance of the body and blood of Christ. The accidents remain. The, the, remain. the appearance remains. It looks like bread, it tastes like bread, it smells like bread. Those are the accidents. But the substance, the very essence which the eye cannot see, it has totally, really, substantially been changed into Jesus Himself. That's why in the Catholic Church since the 7th century, you, could do, you can see this is very well documented. You could go on the internet and, and, and look at these and just be fascinated. There's been over 500 times where the Eucharist at Mass has literally changed even more so into the actual a piece of, of a human heart or, or, or human blood. Actual human blood or an actual human heart. Go on the internet and type in Eucharistic miracles and you're going to fall off your chair. Why, is, why does Jesus go even a step further with these Eucharistic miracles? Because we as Catholics are so thick-headed, we don't believe by faith anymore. And so Christ has to continually remind us, I'm here. This is me. So what's so unique about Jesus Christ? I'll tell you what's so unique about Jesus Christ. Because there's been a lot of people that have come... Uh, you know, in world history that claim to speak for God, right? So uh, I'm, an, I'm, a, I'm a retired cop, so I'm going to do a police lineup up here. Alright? I'm going to, a police lineup, you put six people in the lineup, I'm going to put the Lord Jesus Christ in the lineup and to see if he actually is unique or is he just like anybody else. So I'm going to put Buddha, line him up, Confucius, line him up, Zoroaster, line him up, Abraham, line it up, Muhammad, line him up, Jesus Christ, line him up. I just put six people that say they speak for God. They're on my police lineup, the Jesse Romero police lineup. Fulton Sheen, Venerable Fulton Sheen says this, You know who speaks for God, and here's the test that I'm going to do. There's a full, fourfold test, Venerable Fulton Sheen says, so we can know who actually speaks for God the Father. Number one, we have to see, of all these six people that I just lined up right now, I just plucked them out of history, of all this, these six people, who was pre-announced? Who performed miracles? Were their teachings reasonable? And where are they at right now? Are they six feet under or did they rise from the dead? Guess what? Of all the people that I just put in this lineup, Buddha, Confucius, Zoroaster, Abraham, Muhammad, Jesus Christ, only Jesus Christ's birth was pre-announced. There's no other human being where the, the prophets and the sages and the wise men we're, we're predicting the birth of, of said people. The only person in human history whose birth was pre-announced hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before it happened is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every one of us, when we were born, nobody was saved in, you know, nobody was saved 50 years before I was born. In 1961, Jesse Romero will be born. Nobody cares. I'm a nobody. I'm a nobody that wants to tell anybody that there's somebody named Jesus who can save everybody. None of you were pre-announced. My mom just did, rest her, God rest her soul, she did a sit-up and I came out, here I am. Hey, that's it. Alright. Nobody was saying, there was no fanfare, there was no like, you know, bells and whistles when I was going to born or ten years before I was born. Because I'm a nobody. I'm a sinner that needs a savior like you. You're a sinner that needs a savior. But there's only one person that was pre-announced in world history. Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Bishop Fulton Sheen, he has a book, it's called Life is Worth Living. In that book, he documents all the people that were pre-announced, that pre-announced Jesus Christ. Buddha, the Chinese Ming Dynasty, uh, uh, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, uh, people that you never, you say, what? This guy pre-announced Jesus? This guy? Jesus Christ was the most anticipated person in human history. Number two, remember I got six guys lined up, right? Got me my police lineup here. 
Buddha, Confucius, Zoroaster, Abraham, Muhammad, and Jesus Christ. Six people. By the way, if you go on YouTube, I take a whole hour to do this. I'm only going to take 10 minutes because i got to go on to other topics. But if you want to see this done like a lawyer, go on YouTube and type in Who Speaks for God the Father by Jesse Romero. Because I do this like a lawyer with PowerPoints for an hour. I go slow. But I, go, I have to go fast right now. Second thing about all these six people that I've got in this police lineup is how many of them perform miracles? The only people that perform miracles, Confucius performed no miracles, Buddha performed no miracles, Zoroaster, Abraham performed no miracles, Muhammad performed no miracles. The only, what's a miracle? A miracle is when through supernatural intervention, supernatural intervention intervenes in the natural. The supernatural activity of God intervenes in the natural. That's a miracle. The only person who performed miracles of the six people I lined up is Jesus Christ. The New Testament says He performed 36 miracles that are documented. 36 miracles that are documented. But the Bible also says in John chapter 21 that if everything that Jesus said and did were written down in the Bible, the entire libraries of the world could not contain these books. Jesus Christ was a walking healer. Point number three. What makes Jesus Christ of Nazareth different from any of these other guys in the six-pack lineup? His teachings. His teachings. Fulton Sheen says, somebody who speaks for God the Father must teach things that are reasonable. 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 Now, again, you're going to have to look at the, my, my talk on YouTube if you want to see how unreasonable Buddhist teachings are. If you want to see how unreasonable Confucius' teachings are, first of all, they taught, it, they taught reincarnation, a cyclical view of man, that we're like in a Ferris wheel where we die and we come back again in a lower life, where we die and we come back again. That's nutty. <laughs> when I hear that, when I think, when I read Buddha and Confucius, when I studied them years ago in college, I just think like, I hear the Twilight Zone music. It's nutty. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.27, For it is appointed for a man to die once, and then the judgment, and then the judgment. Every one of us, when we die, we will die, and we will stand butt naked before the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, who died for our sins. And we will be judged. Every thought, every word, every deed will be judged. If you die in mortal sin, you go to hell forever. If you die in a state of grace and friendship with God, you'll go to heaven. Most of us will go through summer school, what I call purgatory. <laughs> we were supposed to graduate in June, but we didn't, so we didn't graduate until September because uh, we had some <clears throat> imperfections left and defects in the soul. Uh, but the Lord Jesus Christ, when you look at the Zoroaster, what he taught. When you look at Muhammad, what he taught. I, I, got, I got a whole talk on YouTube on what Muhammad taught for a whole hour. I read the entire Quran. So I, I can tell you exactly what he taught. Talk about unreasonable. Yeah, here, here's this one. Here's this one. Muhammad in the Quran says that every man, every Muslim male is allowed to have four wives. Go tell your wife today, hey honey, I'd like to marry three other people and bring them home. <laughs> see, how, see how that conversation goes. <laughs> And Muhammad also taught that every man can have four wives plus a girlfriend for one hour. So every Muslim male is allowed to have four wives plus a girlfriend, but the girlfriend only for an hour a day. I don't know, I don't know why the stipulation. Now, without even going further than that, that's about as unreasonable and as whacked as I've ever heard. You can marry four wives? Are you kidding me? Well, Muhammad had 20 wives, and his youngest wife was six years old. Her name was Aisha. Six years old. What do we call a 40-year-old man married, uh, uh, having sex with a six-year-old? Pedophile. Child molester. That's what he was. That's exactly what he was. The Lord Jesus Christ, when you look at the teachings of Jesus, sublime, perfect. Blessed are the peacemakers. 
they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. If your brother sins seven times, forgive him seven times seventy. There is no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for another. When you read the teachings of Jesus Christ, it's the epitome of, 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 of tranquility, serenity, sublime thoughts. In fact, when my mom and dad were dying, they died, they died years ago, my mom and dad, uh, when I would go and visit them as they were dying in their last weeks, last days, you know what I would do? I would sit right next to them and read the Bible. All they wanted for me, from me is to hear the words of Jesus. They didn't care about the news. They didn't care about anything else going on in the world. When I got there to visit them, they wanted me to open up a Bible and read to them the story of Jesus. That's all they wanted. Because that's all that really, really matters. Let me tell you something. Every one of you is going to be dying. 100% of us are going to die. 100%. And when you're dying in some room and your body's racked with cancer, the only thing that's going to be important at that moment is your relationship with Jesus Christ. And at that moment, you're going to realize when Jesus is all you have, you'll realize Jesus is all you ever needed in this world. And the last thing we can say about the Lord Jesus Christ based on Fulton Sheen's analysis of how, how we know who speaks for God... Number three, you've got to teach things that are reasonable. Only Jesus Christ taught things that are reasonable. In fact, there's a Jewish professor that teaches at Hebrew University. Her name's Doc, Dr. Hannah Safrai. She was giving a lecture a couple of years ago, and she said this. She said, of all the teachers that ever walked on, on planet Earth, she said, the teachings of Jesus Christ of Nazareth are the most sublime teachings ever. She says he was a master teacher. He was the pinnacle of all teachers. This is Dr. Hannah Safrai, who teaches at Hebrew University. That's not a Christian. She's a practicing Jew. But she's just looking at the writings of the New Testament, and she's looked at the writings of other wise men, and she says, when it comes to teaching, Jesus of Nazareth, who she says, who I don't believe in, I'm a Jew, I don't believe he's the Son of God or the Messiah, but just look at his pure teachings from the New Testament, he was a master teacher. There was nobody like him. This is a Jewish professor saying this. This is why as a Catholic, I'll tell you, people say, it just what happened to you, man. Catholics don't talk like you. Here's what happened to me. Over 30 years ago, I did something very dangerous. Somebody told me, you think you're bad just because you're a badass boxer and a bad kickboxer? Yeah. W watch my fights on YouTube. I was steeped into the world of fighting. Type it on YouTube later on, Jesse Romero's fight montage. That was my world. I trained with the best fighters in the world back in the 80s in an elite gym in Los Angeles. And this one cop said, Jesse, you think you're bad? He goes, he goes, you ain't so bad. I bet you never read the Bible. I'm like, what? Shoot. Check this out, man. I'll start reading the Bible. 30, probably about 35 years ago, I took a challenge and I said, I'll start reading this book. I'm not afraid of it. I'm Catholic. You know? Started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What happened? I fell in love with Jesus. I got a man crush on Jesus now. You, because as I started reading the story of Christ, I said, okay, either this is all boop, or it's true. A or B. Principle of non-contradiction. A cannot be B at the same time. B cannot be A at the same time. The story of Jesus Christ that I've heard all my life is either true or it's false. 35 years ago, after reading the entire Bible for a year over and over and over, just the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, 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 I said, this guy's a man's man. This is a leader here. Jesus is everything I've been looking for. He's my direction signal. He's my navigation device. He's my Google Maps. He's everything. 
That's why Jesus Christ says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. That's Catholic teaching. Don't listen to anybody who says anything less than that. Jesus is not the privileged way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. What sets Jesus Christ apart from everybody else as well? Remember the lineup I got? I got six people in my lineup. The Buddha, Confucius, Zoroaster, Abraham, Muhammad, Jesus Christ. What sets Jesus Christ apart from all of them? He rose from the dead. He's alive. The other ones, six feet under, compost, worm food. <laughs> Fertilizer. You're dead. Catholics don't follow a dead man. Dead man can't do nothing for you. All those men before Christ, they need a savior. They need Jesus. And they know now that he's the only savior of the world. He's the only savior that there ever was. Jesus Christ, of the six people I put in the lineup, is alive. And he's coming back. In fact, in Jerusalem, Jesus Christ has left a scar on the belly of planet Earth. In Jerusalem, in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, you have four million people a year, tourists a year, pilgrims, I dare say, that go to visit the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. Four million. There is, the, the, the empty tomb of Jesus Christ is the most visited tomb on planet Earth. Why? Because every one of us knows that he's not there no more. That he rose. And that he's a son of God with resurrection power. And he's coming back. The empty tomb of Jesus Christ gives us hope. What do I mean by that? What is hope? The definition of hope according to the Catholic Church is, it is the theological virtue where we as Catholics believe in the promises of Jesus Christ. I don't necessarily believe in the promises of most men today, leaders in our country, in our world. I question most of what they say. Most of them are a bunch of charlatans. But there's one person that I will go to my dying day saying, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. That's Catholicism. That's what it means to be a Catholic man. Come what may, we have no idea what's in store for us in the future, but we do know this. We know who's in charge of the future by divine providence. And his name is Jesus Christ of Nazareth. The Holy Eucharist. What happened? There's two stories or two events that really changed my life on this. I when I started reading the Bible and really connecting back to my Catholic faith in my late twenties. And I started seeing, wow, this is what the church has believed for 2,000 years. And I said, okay, if Jesus is the Son of God, he can do anything. So Jesus can take bread and wine, and he can change it into himself in some mysterious way that we can't see, but yet he's truly there. Why can he do that? Because he's God. Matthew 19, 20, for men, things are impossible. For God, nothing is impossible. Jesus is God. Nothing's impossible. But I'll tell you, here's three things where I've seen. That the Eucharist is Jesus Christ. is actually who he says he is. Back in 1995, when my mom was alive, my mom was going to, she was going to, uh, uh, she was scheduled to go through heart surgery. I forget exactly what she had, but they were going to do open heart surgery on her back in 1995. I know she had an acute case of clogged arteries, and I don't know what else. And so there was a priest from Mexico that came to Los Angeles, California, uh, Father Emiliano Tardif. And he came to California, and he was going to do a healing mass at the convention center. So my mom asked me, uh, she was scheduled to go to open heart surgery on Monday, so that weekend she goes, can you take me and your dad to see Father Emiliano Tardif? He's going to have, have a, a healing mass and pray for us. I said, sure. I kind of rolled my eyes. I'm like saying, my mom's going to be so let down. 
I mean, she's going to go there. She's going to still be sick. She's going to go on Monday to open heart surgery. And uh, I don't know if this is going to impact her faith or what, but I took her. And I, I'm, of course, the typical, you know, young Catholic secular humanist, kind of rolling my eyes like, yeah, he didn't ask, right? Okay, yeah, okay, right, yeah, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. So I take my mom and my dad there, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm participating in Spanish and stuff. I'm participating in the whole Mass and all the prayers and stuff. And at the end, Father Miguel Tardif stands up. My mom received the Eucharist, and I'm just watching her. My, my dad did. I, after Mass, before he did the final blessing, he said, um, I mean, there's probably about, I don't know, there were like 10,000 people there. And he says, um, somebody here, Jesus just healed you uh, of, a, of, a, of an acute disease you have in your heart. In fact, somebody here was going to have open heart surgery on Monday. Jesus has healed you completely. Now, I sat there. I got mad. I was seething. I was saying, well, first of all, this priest doesn't know my mom. But how, I said, how insensitive for this priest to say something like that because he spoke directly to my mom's situation. And I said, and I know my mom's not healed. And she's going to go Monday, and she heard this from a Catholic priest on Saturday night that somebody in the audience was healed of a clogged arteries and is scheduled to have an open heart surgery, but Jesus has completely healed them. And so I was a little bit upset that he said that because I saw my mom, my mom kind of lit up like... Because my mom's just a simple, pious, Mexican woman of faith. She has no formal training or nothing. She just, just, she just has a sincere, childlike faith. And so I went home and I was upset when I heard the priest say that. So Monday, me and my brothers and my dad, we took my mom to the hospital. They prepared her for open-heart surgery. And the doctor says, okay, before we open up, we're going to put the dye in your mom again. And we're just going to check how, we're going to see how far the clogged arteries and we want to see how far it's advanced since the last time we put the dye in her. And so the doctors take her to the back room, they put that dye in her, and then they come back out about 30 minutes later, and they say, they tell my dad, Mr. Romero, uh, your, wife is, your, your wife is dressing, uh, she's going to be coming right out, take her home. My dad said, take her home. Doctors, you guys are going to go open heart surgery. They said, we don't know what to tell you, but your, your, your wife has the arteries of a 30-year-old woman. Why did that happen? Because Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and He's alive, and He has power. And when He feels like it, we'll say like theologically, when He deigns to, I'm a blue-collar guy, when He feels like it, he heals people. I've seen this in my family. We took my mom home. And my mom told me in the car, she said, I told you, son, what Father Emiliano Tardif said on Saturday, I believed it was me. I told you. It was at that moment, this was, this was in 1995, it was at that moment where I said, wait a minute. The Eucharist, this is more than bread. How can bread heal my mother of 90% clogged arteries? This is impossible. Here's another time when I was uh, rocked by the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. I used to get invited all the time to go speak at Franciscan University of Steubenville at their youth conferences. When I had jet black hair and a jet black mustache, I was there all the time. But now that I'm great, they don't invite me anymore. Okay. Now you guys invite me. So this was at Attleboro, Massachusetts, 2006 youth conference. When I still had jet black hair, a full head of hair, it looked like a lion's mane, jet black mustache and a jet black beard. Yeah. You were there? Uh -huh. Yeah, check this out. Okay. So there's about four to 5,000 teenagers as I recall, Father Dave Pavanko was there, Father Stanford Tuna. In the evening, at, at these youth conferences, they do it very well. They bring out the Blessed Sacrament, and they play, they play beautiful praise and worship music proper to the, for, for Eucharistic adoration. As the priest processes with the monstrance, the lights are off. They have just the, 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 the floodlights right on the monstrance. All the kids fall on their knees, 4,500 teenagers singing to God from their heart. It's the most beautiful thing to see at these Steubenville youth conferences. They're life-changing. 
These kids that attend these youth conferences become leaders of the church. And so what happened is there, I saw earlier during the day, there was like this, you know, 10, 11 year old kid, he jumped the fence and came into the conference, but the conference was for 18 and up. And so they escorted him out, you know, just the, you know, some of the volunteers said, you're, how old are you? I'm 11 years old. You can't be here. It's for 18 and up. So they just escorted him out, you know, back outside the facility. He kept jumping the fence and coming in. <laughs> and they kept escorting him out. Now, as Father Dave Pavanka is coming down with the Blessed Sacrament, and I'm, in, I'm here on the stage with, I think, with Father uh, Stanford Tuna, I think even Father Larry Richards may have been there. I forget. We're in the, in the stage. There was a young man, probably in the second row, I, I noticed him right away. He was dressed in all black. He had long black hair. He had black eyeliner, black blush on his face, black lipstick. He was a, one of those gothic, confused kids, but somebody had invited him to the youth conference, which, which was a good place for him to be. But he stood out like a sore thumb, okay? Uh, I mean, he looked like uh, Marilyn Manson, okay? And he's right there in the second row, and there's 4,000, 5,000 Catholic kids, you know, dressed normal. So he stood out. As the priest is processing forward the Blessed Sacrament, he looks back at the Blessed Sacrament, and he screams. It was such a high-pitched scream, like if he was in pain. He fell down on the floor, and he began rolling around, rolling around left and right and fast he was rolling and screaming like he was on fire like like he's trying to put his body on fire he's rolling around left and right very fast and screaming in in these guttural guttural noises and these high-pitched noises it, it, it sounds like again it sounds like a, an animal getting their throats cut in a slaughterhouse and so i'm here on the stage with a couple of priests and I said, Father, do something, you know. I'm looking at them. And they're looking at you. Jesse, what do we do? I'm like, I don't know. You're the priest. Do you? <laughs> don't ask me. So all three of us are arguing in the stage like what to do. This kid is having a demonic manifestation. Without a doubt, this kid was involved in the occult. And he's probably involved in a life of narcotics and in a life of the occult. Uh, opening doors to Ouija boards and witchcraft and, and sorcery. He's probably in a, involved in a life also of sexual perversion. Those are all the doors where Satan comes in into a person's life, especially young people. Those are the three main doors that young people open. The life of sexual perversion, the life of the occult, and the life of intoxication. And so, as a priest and me, we're up here and we're arguing, what do we do for this kid? Remember I told you that there was an 11 year old kid, 10, 11 year old kid that kept jumping the fence and coming in, they kept escorting him out? All of a sudden I saw this 11 year old kid. He stood up in one of the chairs. And I, and I looked, I said, there he is, there's the kid that keeps getting escorted out. So the kid jumped on a chair, and you know, he's a lot smaller than everybody there, because everybody this is from 18 and up, and, he's, and he, he, looks, he looks at the monstrance, where Jesus is being processed, and he looks at the kid, the gothic kid that's rolling around, and the 11-year-old kid, he, as, 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 as I'm arguing with three, three priests and myself, what do we do, what do we do, what do we do? This kid knew what to do. He goes, Jesus! Kick his ass! Kick his ass! I mean, I don't know what, what verse, that's for the, in the Bible, or, or well, that's in the catechism. But here's what he was doing. This kid had childlike faith. He was pointing at the monstrance. He knew Jesus was there. And, he's, and he knows that that kid is being attacked by a demon. The way he's rolling around and screaming in pain. And so the kid is telling, Jesus! He meant, you know, kick the demon's ass. That, that's what he meant. And so I'm, I'm, I'm up there in the stage with a very respected priest. Very respected priest. <laughs> and we're all arguing, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? Like a bunch of you know, we have no idea. What do we do? What do we do? And this kid knew what to do. He saw Jesus. He knew that wasn't bread. He knew that was God. That is God. He knew that was a demon attacking some young man. And he told Jesus to take care of it. I mean, the language wasn't exactly theologically precise, but I think Jesus get <laughs> Jesus gets the point. Because he's God. And Jesus saw the sincerity of his heart. 
guess what happened? When this kid did that like two or three times, Jesus, this kid, this gothic kid stopped rolling around on a dime. Bam! Stopped! Froze, and he stopped screaming and yelling. And he got up, started wiping his eyes. He was crying, and then other adults and priests went over there to go talk to him. Whatever was attacking him, it was a demonic manifestation. This is what demons do. The way demons attack the body is they appropriate the senses of the body. And so the general parts where you see a demon attack in the manifestation, they'll attack the stomach. You'll find the person that's diabolically afflicted, they'll say, there's something in my stomach. There's something growing. I feel like there's a fight in my stomach or the mountain sort of stake. There's something in my stomach. Or you'll actually see the stomach will rise up and go back down. Rise up and go back down. Kind of like those whack a moles Those whack a moles you see at a carnival, it'll, this will happen in the stomach when, there's, when the person's possessed. Also, with demons, they'll also take the voice box. And with diabolical affliction, demons take the voice box and the demon starts speaking through your voice uses your voice box to project messages. And it's not the kid, it's the demon. And they will also appropriate the limbs. The limbs, the demons appropriate the limbs and they will also appropriate the brain. This is what's called the demonic manifestation. That stop, <laughs> why? Some of, the, some of the most holiest priests that I know were on stage with me and there was a lot of holy priests around, and nobody knew what to do. But you know who, who knew what to do? Some 10, 11 year old kid that we kept kicking out of the conference because he was jumping the fence. He knew what to do. From the mouth of babes, right? Faith like a child. Let me give you one more story about the real prince of Jesus Christ. You know who knows? You know who knows? that the real presence of Jesus Christ, the Eucharist, is really Jesus. Who knows that? Satanist. I've talked to a bunch of Satanists and witches throughout the years, living in Southern California. I mean, that's, it's just, it's just, it's just the occult capital of the world. Los Angeles, West Hollywood, San Francisco. You have organized Satanism and organized Luciferian covens over there. It's, 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 a, it's a stronghold. Every Satanist I've talked to, they've all told me, I've asked them, which is the true religion that you guys fear? You know what they say? The Roman Catholic Church. I asked them, why? I act dumb, you know, like I don't know, like I'm a low-information Catholic. I said, really? Why are you guys afraid of the Catholic Church? I mean, why, why, why? we're nice people. Why do you fear us? They'll say, because you guys have something in these golden boxes around the world. You guys have a sacrament there called the Eucharist, which is Jesus himself. Satanists will admit that the Eucharist is not a piece of bread. They'll tell you Catholics, you don't know what's in there? That's Jesus. It looks like bread, but it's not bread, it's Jesus. I'm embarrassed to say Many Satanists have more faith in the real presence than Catholics do. At least they know it. Intellectually, they don't live it, but they know it. And this is why, notice the Church of Satan. Who do they try to imitate? As St. Augustine says, the devil tries to ape God in all things. The Temple of Satan and the Church of Satan, what religion do they try to imitate? Do they try to imitate Jewish services? No. Do they try to imitate Islamic services? No. Do they try to imitate, you know, Benny Hinn and, uh, and Joel Osteen and Protestant services? No. You know what their worship is called? The Black Mass. The Black Mass. Why? Everything in a satanic Black Mass, they have a priesthood, they have chalices, they have a blood sacrifice, they do things liturgically, they have an altar, Everything about the Black Mass is the inversion of the Catholic Mass. Why? <clears throat> the Black Mass is the mockery of the Catholic Mass because Satanists know 
that the one true faith on planet earth given to us by Jesus Christ is the Roman Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic religion that will start in 33 AD. And so this is, they try to worship, they call him Satan's father. Every, every saint he's still talk to, they'll say Satan's my father. That's, that they'll refer, that's the pronoun they use. And their worship of Satan is basically the inversion of the Catholic mass. Here's something else. I was talking, you guys are probably saying, man, this guy's crazy, the people he talks to. I was, I was talking to this one guy who was fully possessed. He was a biker, lived a wretched lifestyle most of his life. Women, drugs, the occult, and he's fully possessed. And he's, he was going through, uh, he's seen the diocesan exorcist at a particular diocese for, for, for sessions of exorcism. He's a bad case. Um, he calls me up every now and then, and we just, I just give him, spiritual guidance and stuff and pray with them on the phone but he asked me one day he said uh, he I said so we'll just call him we'll just call him John I said John um, you'll be fully healed when you can sit through the entire mass and you can participate and you can receive the Eucharist and you won't have any you won't have any aversion any reactions he goes I'm not there yet so I asked him remember he's fully possessed I asked him uh, so are you trying to go to Mass? He says, I'm trying to go. He says, because my exorcist says just what you just said. When I can go through entire Mass, I'm healed. And there's no aversion, and there's no, I'm not nauseous. Uh, he says, I'll be fully healed. So I said, tell me, when you go to Mass, what happens? Here's what he told me. He goes, Jess, I can go to Mass, and I can sit there and participate. He says, for the first half of the Mass, which is called the Liturgy of the Word, and I can Pray the, say the prayers, respond, kneel, stand, everything else, sing the, the antiphons. He says, but when I get attacked, is that the second part of the Mass, the liturgy of the Eucharist, when the priest starts the consecration, the high point of the Mass, he says at that point, the demon inside of me erupts, wakes up and attacks me, and I run out of the church and I go to the bathroom and just throw up and convulse on the floor, like have a grand mal seizure on the floor. He says... I said, so what are you telling me? He says, I'm just telling, I'm telling you that the demon recognizes the Eucharist. Once that bread and wine become the Eucharist, he says the demon inside of me, because he's fully possessed, he says, attacks me at that moment, I have to run out of the church. This is how powerful the Eucharist is. You guys think it's bread. You guys are fools. It's not bread, guys. This is God there. This is God. And as Catholics, you know who also knew this? who also knew this uh, succinctly. During the Crusades in the Middle Ages, 800 years when Islam was attacking Catholic nations and Catholic countries, and Catholics were involved basically in self-defense wars, trying to rescue the Holy Land back Jerusalem from the Islamic invaders. When the Muslims in their jails and their prisons, when they would capture Catholic men after battle, the surviving men during the Crusades, you could always tell who a Catholic priest was in jail. How did we know? Because what the Muslims would do during the Crusades, if you were a Catholic priest and they knew it, they would cut your hands off and they would cut your tongue off. Why? And you'd be in jail without hands and without a tongue. Why? Because the Muslims knew, they would say, their priest with their tongue, they call down God from heaven into that bread and wine. So you've got to take their tongue out. And their hands called down God to change that bread and wine into the Son of God. So you got to cut their hands off. The enemies of the Catholic Church know what the Eucharist is. As Catholics, the Eucharist is the heart of the Catholic Church. This is the heart and soul of Catholicism. That's why personally, personally, I have no power of Suleiman like you, but personally, if I had power, if I had, if I had Episcopal power, which I don't have, okay, no Catholic politician that's pro-abortion would ever receive the Eucharist in my diocese and my church. Why? For their soul. It's because of their soul. And St. Paul is very clear. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 and following, 
If you're receiving the Holy Eucharist in an unworthy manner, you're eating and drinking judgment to yourself. In other words, what does that mean? If you're receiving Jesus Christ into your temple and your temple's dark, full of mortal sin, what you're doing, you're not, you're not receiving the bread of life, Jesus Christ. You're receiving the bread of death. You will be judged and condemned for allowing the Holy God, named Jesus Christ, to come into your defiled temple. This is why as a Catholic, this is everything. If you want to get to heaven, we have to live and die in a state of grace. I wrote a whole book on that. It's called, Lord, Prepare My Hands for Battle. This is a whole manual on how to get to heaven. Living in a state of grace. This is everything. This is everything in Catholicism. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? George Soros and Bill Gates, but lose his soul in the process. Who cares if you've got all the money in the world? If you don't have Jesus, you have nothing. Nothing! Nothing! There's only... We live in 50 states, or our country has 50 states, but there's only two states that really matter. You die in a state of grace or die in a state of mortal sin. A or B. And guess what? There's no do-overs. Yes, my friend. Nobody. Himself. Man's law. Yeah. Remember this, Catholics, Catholic men. We live in a country, and there are some laws in our country that are unjust laws. Remember that. Just because things come from the government, it doesn't mean that they are in accord with God's word. Our standard as Catholic men is God's word. De verbum. God's word. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will stand forever. Acts 5.29. Peter told the establishment back in his day and age, he says, we'd rather obey God than men. As a Catholic, if there's a, a law from Caesar that conflicts with the law of God, you as the Catholic man must always take the default position and say, I'm going to follow God. Because this law here goes against what divine revelation teaches. Even if it means your life. Even if you have to die for your faith. And some of us may die for the Catholic faith in this millennium. But so what? Pain just lasts a little while. And guess what? When you open your eyes on the other side of death, we will be with Jesus and Mary in heaven forever and ever. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 and 5, what is heaven? There are no tears, no crying, no pain, no mourning, more, no wailing. For the old order of things have passed away. Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. Catholic men, we were made for heaven. You were not made for Pennsylvania, New York, California, Arizona, Texas. You were made for heaven. Remember, planet Earth is just a P.O. box. We're not going to live here very long. In fact, I'm gonna, I'll be specific with you. If you want to go to the New American Bible, you can check me out on this. Read Psalm 90. Psalm 90 says the average person lives in, into their 70s. Psalm 90 says if you're very strong, you live to 80. That's not that long. We can't even wrap our minds around eternity. As Catholic men, we were made for greatness. We were not made for mediocrity. And as Catholic men, we have a special, we have a special responsibility. Every single one of you is the priest of your house. The catechism calls your family the domestic church. The catechism calls every single Catholic man, you're the priest of the home. You're the Saint Joseph of the house. Even more so, every Catholic man, Ephesians 5.22, you're the head of the house. Who's the head of the church? Christ is the head of the church. Who's the head of the house? You're the Christ of the family. Let me give you one last thing before. How, Deacon, how much do I have? Just let me know so I can... 10, 5, 1, I don't know. Don't. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, good. All right. I'm going to give you something practical. As Catholic men, we've got to start bumping up our prayer life. The grace of God flows into the family. As St. John Paul II says, the Catholic Father is the icon of God the Father. Repeat it again. 
The Catholic Father is the icon of God the Father. And the grace of God, it's, this is in Exodus chapter 20 and Exodus chapter 32, uh, a father's blessing goes down to the thousandth generation. Powerful. Your prayers and your faith and your blessing flow powerfully like, like, a, like, like, like Niagara Falls. Powerful stream of grace to your family. As Catholic men, you need fraternity, order, and ritual. Fraternity. Find Catholic brothers that believe the same thing like you. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpens another. Number two, you need to have an ordered life. An ordered life. Get rid of all the sin in your life. Get rid of it! Get rid of it! Order, order, order. What type of order am I talking about? Live a pure life. Pray three times a day. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. Morning, midday, evening. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 and 11. And the third thing. Fraternity, order, and ritual. What do I mean by ritual? Holy habits. Virtue. Pursue a life of virtue. Holy habits. Love your wife. Love your family. Love your kids. Love your grandchildren. Be, be Christ to them. And last, the last thing I'll say is this. Start incorporating into your prayer time spiritual warfare prayers for your family. Father Chad Ripperger, who's one of the most respected exorcists in the country right now, him and his team, they put out these prayers that take five minutes to pray at night. They're called Exilium Christianorum. I've been praying these prayers for 10 years every night, anywhere I go. They're in my book here, Lord, Prepare My Hands for Battle, page 121. They are spiritual warfare prayers to drive demons out from your family, from your bloodline, from your children, from your marriage. I pray them every night. Demons yield to the authority of the Father's voice of the house. Just like demons yield to a Catholic priest, a Catholic bishop, demons yield to the patriarch of the house. They know who the St. Joseph of the house is. As Catholic men, prayer three times a day, morning, midday, evening, Daniel chapter 6, verse 10 and 11, and start incorporating spiritual warfare prayers. Why? Prayers are more... Jesus told St. Faustina in her diary, she said, Lord, what type of prayers should we pray? Jesus says, pray precise prayers. Prayers of precision. Ask and you'll receive. Matthew 7, 7. Be precise. These prayers of spiritual warfare are precise. You're asking God through the Blessed Virgin Mary to drive demons out of your family and your bloodline. Thank you very much. God bless you. Keep the faith.